vulnerable. This isn't just an environmental issue, it's a question of justice. The reality is those who have contributed the least to climate change are suffering the most. Island nations face rising tides, threatening very existence of their being. Developing countries grapple with food insecurity due to erratic weather patterns. Indigenous communities seeing their ancestral lands being ravaged by wildlife, fires, and the injustices continue. But despair certainly is not an option. The future is not yet written. We have the power to change and to have a different narrative. One that is of climate justice. Imagine a world powered by renewable energy where clean air and water are a birthright, not a privilege of some. Imagine thriving ecosystems teeming with life, communities working together to build a sustainable future. But what does it all mean? And what does this vision require? It certainly requires bold leadership from governments and for corporations to invest in renewable energy, infrastructure, green technologies, and sustainable practices. To discuss this and to reflect on some of these issues, I have with me today two esteemed friends and colleagues, Dr. Maria Guevara and Mr. Harjit Singh. Dr. Maria Guevara is a humanitarian specialist with a medical doctor profile, trained in critical care, tropical medicine, and a strong background in complex humanitarian settings, global health policy, and advocacy with Doctors Without Borders. She has 20 years of experience and over 10 years management practice in her work in MSF. We also have with us Mr. Harjit Singh, who is an advocate and an activist for climate and social justice globally. Harjit's work has involved assisting countries in responding to disasters, climate impacts, migration, and in bolstering adaptation and resilience programs. He's Global Engagement Director at the Fossil Fuel Treaty Initiative, and it's a great privilege and a pleasure to have you both with us. And if I can start with you, Maria, first, with a question that I think captures all our imaginations, and we have seen multiple references in the last two days at the conference itself, is a justice-oriented approach to climate change. What does it mean, and why does it matter to you? Um, so, hello everyone. Uh, Salamat Peta. I think I got that one right. Um, I hope everybody's not going to go to sleep after a long lunch. <laughs> um, and thank you, Rajat, for the introduction and for the invitation to be part of this really important exchange and this um, great conference. It is quite an honor for me to be sitting here with both of my co-panelists as um, I'm a big fan of the collective work that each has done on fighting for justice and human rights. So I was going to address this question that's been addressed to me uh, from two sides of the same coin, both from the rights and ethics angle and maybe vulnerability and responsibility. As I, I came into the issue of climate change and hence climate justice quite late, considering the long fight that many of you probably in this room has been doing for decades, so while relatively new in this field, it is not my first interaction with justice, nor my first foray into the fight for social justice. So as a trained physician, I took the Hippocratic Oath, the Medical Professions Code of Conduct, the Code of Medical Ethics, in which justice, in this case, distributive justice, that all persons or patients will be treated fairly and equitably. It also means not only respecting the rights of individuals, but also treating all patients in a given situation with the same, same way, regardless of who they are. For me, I see rights and ethics as two sides of the same, the same coin, where behind every patient right is one or more ethical principle from which that right is, de is derived. So before working with MSF or Médecins Sans Frontières, I'm, I will be using acronyms, so sorry, it is MSF, it's the same thing as Doctors Without Borders. Um, what, what this meant to me as a practitioner at the very direct patient level care 
um, in the US was more from that clinical practice perspective. But since the last 20 years, it has been quite at the very social, public, and global scale. So working as a medical humanitarian is a constant battle in answering to the impacts of structural violence, not only that of the direct violence of war and conflicts, which we have seen tremendously increase in this last few years. According to my, some of you may know, the late Dr. Paul Farmer, who was a pioneer in global health and a founder of Partners in Health with which um, MSF has worked closely, he said, it is not by chance the world's poorest are also the sickest. It is to these health disparities and the inequities wrought by social structures and systems that MSF aims to respond, hoping in one way or another to not only manage that unfortunate reality, but also address, if not speak to, the underlying drivers. For those who may not know MSF and the work of the organization, we are an international independent medical humanitarian organization rather quite a private international association made up of mainly doctors and health sector workers, but not only. We're also made up of logisticians, engineers, administrators, also lawyers. We do not consider ourselves a rights-based organization per se, but we do speak to human rights, especially to the rights to health. We are more, more an ethics-based organization we are mainly bounded and guided by our charter and principles, and that is the principles, the medical ethics, as I've mentioned, and that of humanitarian principles, especially and particularly the principles of neutrality, we do not take sides, the principles of impartiality, providing assistance based on need alone, without discrimination, particularly of those in most need, working to ensure access to quality care, and of course of independence. The fact that we have financial independence where we have funding from greater than 90% from private individuals like you and me allows us to access those most hard to reach and allows us to speak truth to power. We particularly provide assistance to populations in distress, to victims of natural or more today man-made disasters and to victims of armed conflicts saving lives, alleviating suffering, and promoting and restoring dignity is the core of MSF's work, especially providing it for the most vulnerable and bearing witness to their realities. When we were founded in 1971, it was a group of doctors that had worked with Red Cross at that time, and journalists who came back from that war in Nigeria just brought with what, was, what they were witnessing. And that was what they wanted to do, was to highlight and shed light on what, what that famine and war was, how it was decimating the populations. So if therefore then climate justice means putting equity and human rights at the core of decision-making and action, in this case on climate change, then it is a natural extension of humanitarian action. In climate negotiation terms of mitigation, adaptation, and loss and damage, what cannot be mitigated and adapted to will be suffered as loss and damage. And this suffering, we know, is felt first and foremost by people living in poverty, people without access to essential health care or social support systems, people who are living in fragile and conflict-affected states, the marginalized, the vulnerable, the displaced, in short, people and communities MSF serves. Loss and damage is emergency to MSF and it is a humanitarian concern, as it is already happening now and is today's reality for the poorest and most vulnerable populations, who more often than not are the ones that have contributed the least to the crisis. We have an opportunity to be proximate to these people and communities who are paying the highest price and therefore we have the responsibility to give voice to that reality. And that's how we do it at MSF. Thanks a lot, Maria, for those remarks and also uh, bringing out the interconnections between rights, ethics, equity, and justice. 
It's important you refer to Paul Farmer and his work and the importance that he brought to the principle of right to health. And as Paul famously said, if health is a human right, who is considered human enough to have that right? And the dehumanization of agenda of populations that we are facing begs the question, who's listening? And what do these injustices mean? And can we really address the injustices in climate without addressing injustices that are happening elsewhere? And with that, Harjeet, I would like to come to you for your perspective on why a justice-oriented approach matters and what does it mean to you? Thank you so much, Rajat, for asking that question. And uh, in the last few days, uh, where we have had so many inspiring interventions and we have learned so much, and seeing how we are coming together as a community to talk about planetary health is really energizing and motivating for us to go back. But the task won't be over, and this happens to be the last uh, panel, so I think it's important to also talk about you know, where, where we have come from and what those injustices are. And I would like to take you back to early 90s when senior Bush said, the American lifestyle is not up for negotiation. The US knew 50 years ago, and it's all out in public, what is causing the climate crisis. It's the extraction and burning of fossil fuels, yet, U.S. remained silent and the convention has no mention of fossil fuels and senior Bush saying that you can't tell us what needs to be done which is going to affect our economy and that stance continued through three decades of negotiations. The same tone and tenor and for the last 15 years I have been attending negotiations and seeing how the United States actively blocked negotiations and we could not make any substantive progress on how to deal with the crisis. At that moment, we were confident we are going to be able to avert it and look at where we are 30 years down the line. We are living through climate emergency. That's injustice. We see no finance and technology being provided to developing countries. Instead, the same fossil fuel based development model to create more markets for the Western companies was the agenda at climate talks. That's injustice. You convert climate talks into trade talks so that you can make more money by investing in developing countries so that your companies can thrive. That's injustice. You export the same model of development that has caused havoc now and we are talking about the planetary crisis. That's injustice. Our oceans have become dumping ground of all kinds of plastics and, and pollution. We are facing biodiversity crisis. We are facing energy crisis. We are talking about climate crisis that is connected with all these crises. That's injustice. And all this has happened because of a bunch of countries and a bunch of corporations who have caused this havoc. There was a report which mentioned that only 100 companies are responsible for more than 70% of greenhouse gas emissions. And there was a recent report just a couple of days ago which said 57 companies are responsible for more than 80% of emissions between 2016 to 2022. That's injustice. And then it is expected of all of us to take action when we are stuck with that extractive model of development. That's injustice. So we know who the culprits are. We know who have caused this planetary crisis and we know who have to take most action. So the conversation that we need to be having is about, as Maria rightly said, is about justice, about equity. But before that, we have to be very clear who we need to target, who has caused these injustices and how we are going to hold them to account. And that's what we need to be really focusing on. That's what should be at the core of our strategy to have our planetary action to avert multiple crises that we are facing right now. Thank you. Well said. Well said, Harjeet. And thank you. Thank you for outlining not only the injustices that underpin and the, and the journey that we have had to where we are, but also a few key things that you pointed out. One, for me, that strikes a lot is the difference between a state's ability 
and its willingness to take action and how the ability is often compromised by other factors and the impact also and what we do not talk about is almost like a hidden undertone of several of our conversations is often the role of powerful private actors the companies that are driving this agenda and the impact that is having because we really do not know how to effectively bring them to the negotiation table and to take action that will result in meaningful change and influence the ability of state parties to do what they have to do on their behest. Coming back to you, Harjit, could you tell us a bit more about what you are doing in your organization with the work on the fossil fuel treaty and how you are taking some of these questions and conversations forward? Sure, Rajat, and let me circle back to what I uh, just said. When you don't find the mention of fossil fuels in the climate convention way back in 1992, you could think that it could be an accident. We were not very well aware. Paris Agreement happens in 2015, no mention of fossil fuels, no reference to coal, oil or gas. When these three things have caused the climate crisis, do you think it's an accident or we overlook that? It's an invisible hand of the fossil fuel industry which has caused the crisis and it's not being held to account. And we also need to recognize that there are millions of workers around the world, both in the developed and developing countries who have been, you know, made to work in these extractive industries. And we all know the health crisis that they face because of the poor working conditions and of course, uh, what fossil fuels do to climate crisis, yet they are stuck with it. And there is no global framework that looks at the issue of fossil fuel phase out comprehensively. Yes, we had a bit of uh, victory at COP28 after years and decades of fight, but that's not enough by just mentioning, just transitioning away from fossil fuels without putting finance behind it. And with so many loopholes in the decision, we will not be able to deal with it. So what we are trying to do is to demand a fossil fuel non-proliferation treaty which should be complementary to Paris Agreement because Paris Agreement only talks about mitigation, adaptation and loss and damage and we are not saying that we need to be undermining Paris Agreement but we need a whole new set of agreement to look at the issue of fossil fuel phase out comprehensively. We need to be talking about just transition and again not enough conversation has happened. We need to be talking about no new uh, exploration or expansion of fossil fuels. Uh, United Nations Secretary General has said it, it's economic madness. I will say it's also social and environmental madness if you continue to invest into exploration and expansion. Even the IEA, you know, International Energy Agency, which has been so conservative is now coming out and say, we can't invest uh, more in fossil fuels anymore. So if we need to phase out fossil fuels in a just and equitable manner, you cannot do it unless you have a global agreement. I know there is a lot of fatigue around international agreements. I know Paris Agreement has not delivered and, and so is true for many other international agreements. But when the crisis is global, when only a bunch of companies and a few corporations are involved, we taking action back home at our own level is not going to help. It's a global crisis. So you need a global solution. So that's why we are demanding this fossil fuel non-proliferation treaty, which can actually look at all these issues in a far more holistic manner and provide support. We need international cooperation, we need finance. And without finance and technology, this transition is not going to happen. Trust me, we can meet 10 years later, we'll be in a far worse situation if you don't have an international agreement to make that happen. And with us, the kind of support we have got, you know, we, now there are 12 nations and those 12 nations are asking uh, for a treaty to be negotiated but there's also a groundswell of support that we have seen. Half a million people are demanding a treaty. We have 101 Nobel laureates calling for it. We have got 3,000 scientists and academicians calling for it. We have support of health community representing millions of workers calling for the treaty. And that's, that's what is needed. So when you have faith community, health community, you have indigenous people all calling for it and states have also come forward. That's what is needed to really fix the problem at the scale at which it's needed. Thank you. Thanks a lot uh, for that, Harjit. And, and I'll come back to uh, the question of solidarity and cooperation a little later. But before going to Maria, can I have a quick follow up? And, and it's remarkable what you are trying to do. And it's remarkable that you, what you are trying to do in terms of challenging the status quo with the fossil fuel industry. But we also know there are costs 
that come with it. These are very powerful private actors that are not ready to give the space. And the costs sometimes come in threats, in intimidation, in other tactics. And I was wondering if you could share some of those experiences with us as well. Rajat, you were at Amnesty and, and uh, you know a lot about the human rights violations that are happening around the world. And we are also seeing how human rights defenders, you know, and now in the climate space who are trying to protest against this, these exploitative and extractive practices of these companies are facing death threats. They are not getting any support. And we also know that both in developed and developing countries, the governments are in the pocket of these corporations. And, and this is exactly the reason you need a groundswell, you need movements. If we leave it only to governments, it's not going to happen. And what we need is, is a momentum, a movement that is going to call those, those private actors out. And I must also mention that the way money is rather going to the same culprits, fossil fuel industry, they are making profits on, on the back of energy crisis, climate crisis and, and, and biodiversity crisis. Here we are saying there is no money. Uh, for climate action, but at the same time you see the same fossil fuel industry and companies are making hundreds of billions of dollars of profits and it's not only now the developing world, people in the rich world are also uh, have to choose between eating and heating. So, and companies are making money. So I think we know who the culprits are, we know they are making it very difficult for, for everybody around the world, so we need to really call them out. Thanks for that, Hajit. And before coming to Maria, just a shout out uh, for our group and the audience. Get your questions ready. We do have some time uh, for your questions, reflections and reactions, not just to the panelists, but experiences that you may want to share from your work on climate justice. So we'll go to Maria to listen about the experience of MSF incorporating a justice oriented approach. And then we'll open it up uh, to the audience before coming back to our guests. You. Thank you. Uh, thank you. I, just to link the conversations that we've had in the discussion about taking things into account, one of the, my roles in MSF as an international medical secretary is taking into account what MSF is doing at the field. One of the things we do, obviously, is highlight, as I've said, bear witness to what we are seeing on the field, using that as the story and the data to give to, at the high level platforms, to counter private sectors and others in their language. We have a lot of experience, for example, to access to medicines and speaking to the big pharma um, on this. And one of the, the elements is because we have the data, we see what is happening and the real impacts on the ground. And in 2022, we usually do an annual uh, review when we have the 2022, because we're doing 2023 now as we speak. But what we have been witnessing is tremendous impact, the triple threats of conflict, post-COVID and climate crisis or climate change. And the numbers has ballooned tremendously, just a few. Um, we went, before COVID, we were running about 800 projects globally. After it's 930 projects across 85 countries. Our outpatient consultations, they've rose, they have risen by 30% just from one year to the next, um, from 12 million to over 16 million and nearly 20% increase in our inpatient services. Nutritional emergencies has represented an important doubling of severe acute malnutrition and tripling in numbers in our ambulatory feeding centers of over 400,000 cases. The majority of that is in the Sahel, Niger, Niger, Nigeria, Chad, and the Democratic Republic of Congo. Of course, we knew about the flood in Pakistan, Malawi, Madagascar, and South Sudan, all responding in the same year. And disease outbreaks are dom have dominated this last couple of years. Post-COVID wake, because of a routine epi was broken, and just the impact of, clim of climate changes, warming um, situations, uh, especially on climate-sensitive diseases, has just has ballooned. Cholera outbreaks in over 30 countries today with only one vaccines, and there's a huge 70 million vaccine gap. Um, you've seen it in places that have not seen it for decades. Um, dengue is ballooning everywhere as well. It's in near pandemic proportions. Um, we have responded in Honduras, for example, in seven dengue outbreaks just since the last decade. And our malaria numbers have mentioned yesterday in one of our panels has doubled 
also to 4.2 million just in 2022. So we do this because we want to be able to speak to it, but we also take into account our responsibility and how to do things better um, and uh, apply to that. And one of the ways we are doing that, and that's why planetary health framing is so important, because it really highlights the importance of our own responsibility at the center as humans and our impact with our natural ecosystems. It, it highlights how broken our human systems are and it's not fitting with natural ecosystems, but it also highlights the urgency that we need to do it now and act now and the importance of building alliances and working together and because we cannot do this challenge alone. And in the last session on communications, the thing is, we are not alone. We have you all here in this room together to do that. Um, and what we're doing on, on this is from the perspective on operational adaptation, again, being smarter in the way we do things, anticipating and understanding the climate or rather the environment and understanding where the policies are intersecting badly with what we're seeing. Um, on footprint, taking our own responsibility on the do no, from the do no harm perspective of medical ethics on how we really need to mitigate and be our own voice to show that it can be done and should be done. Um, and then finally on advocacy, we've spoken a lot at the COP um, for the last five years, but we're also, because we're able to highlight what we're seeing on the ground. And it's amazing that COP28 had a health and a recovery relief, recovery, recovery and peace day but it's not enough to bring the things on the table. There's huge gap data on what's, what is being seen from the global south, and we need to ensure that that data comes into evidence and put forth into research and practice. And I think, I think this is what is important, is giving voice to that and what we're seeing and impacting, so we can speak truth to power indeed. Well said, Maria, thank you so much for that. And outlining for us not only how different crises intersect and what now is being often called as a state of poly crisis or perma crisis that we find ourselves in, but also how injustices overlap with each other and how they create unique vulnerabilities. And the example of Sahel that you give us is a very telling one because that's where we do see these crises uh, overlapping with each other. I would like to now open it up uh, to the audience for their reactions, questions. Uh, please go ahead, sir. We'll take three, and I see there is one already on our Slido, so we'll read that in the meantime as well. Please go ahead. Uh, hi, thank you so much for the lovely panel. I'm Salman Khan. I'm a medical intern, and I'm a member of the International Federation of Medical Students Associations. So uh, I think most of us in the room do agree that we are living in a period of constant human rights violations, a very unstable world order, and a rise of hypernationalism that is uh, sort of doubling down on the grassroots uh, activism related to climate justice. And that is in some shape or form preventing us to grow our numbers because people think uh, or people react as if the conversations around climate justice are uh, you know, quote unquote, uncomfortable or quote unquote, too political at this point. So how do you see us tackling this multifaceted problem as the planetary health community? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and while I don't see any other hands popping up right now, please go ahead, ma'am. Uh, thank you, Sharon Freel from the Australian National University. This was truly, truly marvelous. Um, I'm really intrigued, and I suppose it's particularly for you, Hajit, um, so within the fossil fuel movement, there, I, I see some of the work that we do at the Planetary Health Equity Hothouse examining things like export credit agencies, which are really the biggest public finance into fossil fuels that exist, that are creating new markets for fossil fuels around the world. Canada is one of the, the biggest um, drivers of this, but it's not just Canada. These have incredible opportunities to activate and create markets for renewables. But because of the incumbent interests, the coalitions of interests within these countries that are just absolutely benefiting from the fossil fuel uh, trajectory, 
I'm really intrigued how the conversations within sort of the transnational uh, civil society movements are engaging, because a lot of these discussions are still happening at the national level. It's the same with the carbon border adjustment mechanisms. Some of the biggest protectionist mechanisms that are being put in place by uh, particularly the European Union, which are going to be incredibly harmful for the majority world. So I just would love to hear how uh, transnational civil society organizations are or could be at those tables bringing the planetary health arguments to bear. Thank you. I saw one more hand. We'll take that and then we'll come to the panel and try and squeeze in a second round as well. Please go ahead, sir. Um, hi, I'm Yash and my question is simple. So on one side, we have fossil fuel as the biggest emitter causing climate change. And on, other, on, the, on the other side, we have this movement towards renewable energies. And we are now seeing rise in problems on exploitation of resources to the movement to the transition to its renewable energy, for example, the cobalt mining in Congo and etc. So in the world of achieving efficiency in the means of high production and economic stability is climate justice or justice itself relevant? Thank you. Thank you. Very good questions. And also on Slido and please do keep on coming. So I guess the question to the panel is, there are inherent contradictions, oh, aren't there, in, in different paradigms that we are trying to navigate and it? what do we do about it? I can wait. And I particularly like the other question uh, that I think pointed to the fact that uh, a former colleague and uh, the High Commissioner for Human Rights said, I'm frustrated with the term polycrisis because if there is one, that is that of leadership and nothing else. Um, so how do you look at these inconsistencies and contradictions, Haji? Before I come to that, uh, let me also pick up the question on, on what Salman asked on political and, and then um, the question uh, from this lady on um, some of the financial instruments. And I'm so glad you asked this question at this moment. This week, there is a spring meeting of World Bank is happening and we know that we are facing a massive problem with the financial system. In fact, if you go on social media and um, check this hashtag, fix the finance, you will see many of us relaying this message because it's not about lack of money. It's about money going to the wrong places and you know, massively and very little to the right places. Let me give you a number. A um, couple of years ago, we were talking about, we saw an IMF report, which of course we know that trillions of dollars are going into uh, fossil fuel industry in the form of subsidies. And when I say trillions, it's not a hyperbole. When you actually calculate, it's $11 million a minute. Let me repeat, $11 million a minute. And that was 2021. And you know how much it became in 2023? $13 million a minute. Look it up. It's IMF report. I'm not making up a number. So there is money available. There are those expert, you know, export credits and many other financial uh, ways to actually shift this money going to bad things to renewable energy and all that investment that has happened in renewable energy of course we all celebrate but you know what it is only feeding to the increased demand at this moment i wish i could show you a graphic you know a graph which tells you that in 2009 our dependence on fossil fuels as part of the global energy system was 80.3 percent and how much it was in 2019 80.2 percent that's where we are so we are stuck with that system and as you very rightly said it's a political economy and the lack of leadership that is causing this crisis and if i connect that to the last one i'm sure maria is going to add that has pushed us to make these choices the kind of economic system that has been created that we are stuck with it and we as individuals are not given those right kind of choices. I know uh, Dr. Jamila uh, on day one said she doesn't like the word degrowth. Uh, and of course, in developing countries, we can't use that. But in developed countries, we have to talk about degrowth. 
we have to talk about regenerative practices and not exploiting which is connected to the last question of what kind of options and alternatives we are creating thank you thank you ajit and and for outlining those things but also you know this 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 whole edifice is premised on a simple fact of solidarity and cooperation and if this is where we are in terms of how how countries and powerful actors are behaving how feasible it is and we let's come back to that but first to you maria i i guess i just wanted to answer to how do we bring the community and then how do you get to the table i mean, i think i think organizations like myself uh, my organization we do work so closely in proximity with the community and we're we're also changing this kind of concept of really reinforcing not only patient centered but people and co community centered bringing them in with us I, I remember very clearly from our colleagues actually in Brazil who were saying that the, the indigenous populations there were saying to them no we're not we're not asking you to speak for us we're asking you to help ha give us the voice so they can speak for themselves and so this is sort of allowing this opportunity and giving your seat to them and I think this is where we're we're trying really hard to bring that element and capacity, especially in the big platforms like COP20, the COPs or the bonds or even the World Health Assembly, wherever that might be needed to be spoken to. And I think this is where we need to start connecting those dots. And I just wanted to say about leadership a little bit. Um, I think we need to learn from communities because this is where the traditional relationship with this, our spiritual connection with um, an energetic connection with Mother Earth. We can really learn in how we look at nature-based solutions, how we mimic nature and how leadership should be done. Do we want to look at from the roots system of trees and how we connect and support the society at large and keep those alive as, we, as the youth grows? I think this is how we need to maintain the connectivity and to have a more regenerative type leadership, a more courageous and bold leadership. And we need to start that from, from the youth. Absolutely, Maria. And, and then thank you for actually bringing home the point about voice, spaces, and narratives. But we do need to make sure the voice of those impacted the most is in the spaces that are making these decisions but also the fact that we do need a different narrative, a narrative that speaks to the veracity of issues and concerns that we are talking about. Colleagues, we have a few minutes to squeeze in a couple of any final questions that you may have or reflections to share as well. So please go ahead. I cannot see. Oh, please. and there are some on the screen as well that we'll come back to definitely. So let's take one over there. The lady on the right here. I can see the hand. Uh, when I'm talking about justice issues in the Netherlands or in some of the developed countries, I very often put off my audience. And what you're seeing a lot is that many of the relatively poorer people in rich countries are getting very annoyed with global justice issues. They would rather like to see that justice is done within their own countries because of the increasing inequality in rich countries. So for example, the subsidies for rich companies on fossil fuels are quite high, but there are no subsidies for poor people using uh, fossil fuels to move to renewables. Uh, so what is happening right now is when you bring this message to the rich countries, to the people there, it becomes really difficult to keep them on board. And I'm really afraid now that our people are now voting for extreme right parties that don't even believe in climate change as a consequence. Any advice? Thank you. Thank you very much. And indeed, uh, a critical point how we cannot really address injustices in the climate context without addressing the larger paradigms. And, and again, re-emphasizing the issue of our deeper political economy analysis. Ma'am, please go ahead for the final question. And then I'll come to the panel and also for reflections for the questions on the Slido. Please go ahead. Hello. Uh, so I'm in the U.S. and hearing you guys talk about like the role of the U.S. and all that. What are things that people in the U.S. can do to help as far as like people from the outside perspective? Um, I know that right now, I don't know how many 
people here are aware, but there's like a lot of protests happening all across the US. Um, it seems like this is really a moment where like the public is really aware and they are really angry. Is there anything from being on the outside um, that you see as maybe like the best way to channel that or support you guys more? <laughs> Thank you. I, I'm sure there are a multitude of answers, especially given the event uh, in November that you're going to have. But let's come to another one. Is the elephant in the room tax and tax justice? We've talked about windfall tax for fossil fuel companies. This is not really happening in the way in, it, in which it should and the money going to, the, to where it actually needs to go to. Could we address that, please? Absolutely. And, and I thank you so much for bringing that point. And I'm sure the panel has some reflections because it's not just the issue of, uh, of industry as in the fossil fuel industry, but the complexity of private action, whether it is fiscal policy or also foundations uh, and large uh, philanthropic foundations which are having very sizable impact on how decisions are being made in this space. So um, let me reverse the order and come to you, Maria, first and then Haji and then we go into wrapping it up. I'm not answering the question on taxes. I'm gonna give it to the expert. <laughs> I'm just a health person. Um, but what I, what I wanted to highlight is, um, I think there is a, the protest is probably in, in the US, I'm American as well. Um, sorry. Um, but <laughs> um, but, I, think, um, but I, I, think, I think it's just, there is, a global angst and it's being felt in every society and this is how we need to link together those voices we need to educate ourselves and that's why I come back to our own responsibilities to know what we can do individually and within our institution within our countries and not stay dumbed down which is what whatever what the powers that be are trying to do is to keep keep the powers where it is we need to keep pushing that critical mass until we can turn that over. I know that does. I know that that's all lovely speak, but it is what we must do, and we need to find that narrative and push that button that will make a difference. Um, and there are those. And again, I'm going to come back to what Shweta said earlier in the session before. We are not alone, and I think we need to find those people wherever you are, in your house, in your, in your community, in your country, in your institution, and connect and network, because it's, this is that larger mass that's gonna speak to the people that are actually making decisions today that are harmful to all of us. Thanks. Uh, let me pick up the question that Joita asked, and, and I totally agree and recognize the challenge, um, what's happening uh, in the Western world where right-wing politics is, is gaining a lot more ground. But I also think that we are at a very crucial point uh, where the kind of analysis that we needed 10, 20, 30 years ago was not there. But now, look at where, what we are talking about. We are talking about planetary level action and the crisis and how these are all intertwined and how it's all because of you know few corporations and that message has to be communicated yes there is no doubt that in the climate uh, justice campaigning we focused and still do a lot on countries because when we talk about the ecological space those countries and their policies and that's why i mentioned the us it's also european union it's also japan and we have seen how they have not delivered but at the same time, we now need to recognize, and I, as I shared those numbers, how just a few companies are responsible for the crisis. And I think what we need to be doing in our communication, Joita, as you asked, we need to be putting those culprits right out there. Because the crisis that people are facing in rich countries are also caused by the same culprits, and that message has not been delivered enough. And if we say that, and how those politicians are in the pockets of the same companies, who have caused the global crisis and are also making it difficult for an average, you know, American, average Canadian and average European to live a, a normal life is because of those companies and how they are the ones sucking up all the profits, not paying taxes, that's also connected, getting all subsidies and making people and planet suffer. That message has to be, has to be delivered. And if, when people say that, you know, right wing is winning, we are not, 
Honestly, my response is, I'm not surprised. And we didn't deserve it. Let me explain. Sorry, I know, I know we are out of time. My question is, did we try enough? Did we really work together? Did we have this kind of understanding to really connect all the dots? Have we really gone beyond our egos? How much comfort level do we have to work in networks beyond our organizations, brands and logos? You know, yesterday, uh, Dr. Kumar was very rightly saying that, you know, when you go to a meeting, you find that everybody is drawing a line which are parallel and repetitive and waste of resources. Just connect those lines. Are we doing that? We're too much focusing on ourselves. We have not worked hard. Right wing has a very clear, sharp narrative. They are united. They have single point agenda. We don't have. We have, we have metrics. We are measuring so many things. Let's come together. At least now, we are at a point when the analysis is sharp. We know who have caused the problem. Let's just be laser sharp in our focus and hit that target. There are questions coming who we should be targeting. We should be targeting those companies and those governments who are being influenced by those companies. So I think we are at a point, I feel a lot more positive, but at the same time, I also take a lot of responsibility upon myself, my own organization, you know, the movement that I work with. Let's grow beyond our egos. Let's work together. Let's support each other. Have that kind of solidarity, Rajat, that you are saying we need it. And we are at a point that we can actually do it. Well said, uh, Hajit, and thank you for bringing us to that conclusion. And as you rightly said, we cannot talk about justice without talking about accountability and accountability of each other and to each other as well. My sincere thanks uh, to the organizers, to Jamila, for actually giving the space to have this conversation because this is not a one-off. These are conversations that we need to be having in many more spaces, in many more ways. So thank you so much to both of you, Harjit and Maria, for having these reflections shared with us and to the organizers as well. Thank you.